Hey everyone, welcome to today's podcast episode. I'm your host, Matthew Lilly, and we are going to be talking about revival and awakening today. I believe that you can be a part of seeing a move of the Spirit of God right where you are, in your home, in your city, in your region. I believe God wants to pour out His Spirit, bring awakening, bring His kingdom right where you are. And uh, you may not realize it, but you might be standing on a deep well of revival right where you are in your, in your city, in your town, in your nation. And uh, there may be some simple things that you and your community can do to begin to unlock the flow of the well of revival that God would begin to move more and more right where you are, right in your city. And we want to encourage you. We want to give you faith today. And we want to give you some practical tips even on how you can be a part of what God wants to do right there where you are, wherever you are based. And so I've got my great friend with me today, Dr. Michael Thornton uh, from Greenville, South Carolina. He's a part of Garden Church, and he's the director of Garden College there in Greenville, South Carolina. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Matthew, it is so good to be here. I love you, my brother. I do miss you in person. I know we have a good a miss good history. Too. Yes, man. Yeah. A good long history that goes back uh, many years now. Um, yeah. in, into the Carolinas, uh, we've traveled America together and, uh, it's true. It's really, it's really awesome to be here with you, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. It's great to talk with you too. Uh, maybe just take a minute, introduce yourself, share a little bit about your ministry, your family, kind of what you're doing there. Absolutely. Uh, so as, uh, Matthew said, I'm Michael and, uh, I am married to Amber Thornton, my beautiful wife of, uh, 15 years, 15 years of marriage. And uh, we awesome. have we have five beautiful children, four daughters and one son. That's right. I said four daughters <laughs> and one son. And uh, Matthew knows what I'm talking about. Our sons, uh, we're, they're the smallest out of our, our girls. Yeah, uh, we share that in common. Um, but we're, we're in Greenville and um, I have the privilege and the honor to serve as a director of Garden College, which is a three year a discipleship school that has an on-campus and online presence uh, here in Greenville. Uh, we have some students as far as England on our online program, um, and that is just amazing, a, a beautiful joy to see how God is, is growing, fathering and mothering this next generation uh, into, into what God is calling them to do. My wife, Amber, also serves alongside with me here. She's actually a trauma counselor on staff here at the church and she counsels with leaders um, both pastoral marketplace and students as well so um, but yeah our our kids all part of the community uh, part of the school here so we're we're deeply ingrained it's awesome i love it man well this is a podcast produced by awaken the dawn and so we love tents and (laughs) you and i have connected over the years through tents yes uh in an interesting way, originally kind of uh, through revival history here in Eastern North Carolina, where our family is back now here, at Greenville, North Carolina, mm. you're Greenville, South Carolina, but you and I connected around really revival history of this region. Uh, and then God led us on this fun journey of doing some tents, especially here in Eastern North Carolina, but like you said, even in other parts of the, of the country. And I, I know that you guys just did a tent recently there uh, I thought maybe you could just share a little bit about what you guys did. Cause I'm sure it was, it seemed like it was awesome. Saw some stuff on Instagram. So yeah, may, maybe just give us a quick, quick update. What's going on. You guys have a tent right out front of your church. <laughs> yes, absolutely. We have one right now. I don't know what it is. I, uh, I've just come to realize tents follow us wherever we go. We find <laughs> ourselves in tents and, uh, we just got done doing a weekend of day and night worship and prayer here um, on campus. And, uh, and basically our church every year has a, has a uh, gathering called the table gathering. It's like the annual gathering. They've been doing it for eight years. Um, this year was the first year we decided to do it under the tent and also mm. add day and night worship and prayer to it. And so, you know, typically it's been a conference style where we invite speakers, even breakouts and, and you do those things. But this year, um, our senior leader, uh, Chad, felt from the Lord that we're not going to invite any speakers this year. We're going to minister to the Lord. And so we just wow. we just we just built day and night prayer and the community came around 
home groups, musicians, youth. And we just, as a family, we took turns in keeping the fire lit on the altar. And then we just had had wild nights um, of just uh, food and fellowship. One thing, and Matthew, you know this, is that we learned food is a major, major part of the kingdom in the New Testament. There is a paradox to it, right? There's feasting and there's fasting. And so yeah. we had a beautiful marriage of the two, of feasting and fasting. And so at night, we'd have these big Moravian-style love feasts with the community, but all in the context of worship. It was really powerful. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that 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 was the cool part about when, when we were doing some tents together for that season was you really had a heart for evangelism, revival, even hospitality, compassion, making food for people. And, you know, we were typically would set up in low income neighborhoods typically. Uh, and then we were doing burns. So we were doing the day and night worship and prayer. And so we were like, let's throw in together. Let's do day and night worship and prayer, but also let's feed people. Let's share the gospel with people. And this is back 2014, 15, 16. Yeah. So really before Awaken the Dawn, really even kind of blew up into a national tent movement. We were here doing basically the exact same thing. Uh, and now through ATD, there's tents continuing to happen all wow. over the nation. I mean, and, and some, some of it we keep up with, but some of it, the Lord is just uh, stirring people's hearts to do tents, just like what you guys are doing there. Um, so I have, I, I've shared before, I think on here, I, I kind of have a, a love hate relationship with tents, you know, I really love <laughs> indoor plumbing and heat and air, (laughs) but there's something about tents, Mm. uh, that God likes something that they speak to, I think prophetically about what's in God's heart to tabernacle with his people and, uh, to meet and, and also to welcome the lost into his presence. I think that Mm. that there's sort of no walls, you know, he invites people in to know him. So yeah. Any other thoughts on tents, Mike, before we kind of shift you know i i i talked to i talked to the father about this a lot and i said what is yeah. it with tents you know because in the bible right he told david david had such a desire to build him a house and he's like david mm-hmm. you know I'm, i've never complained i i don't mind being in the tent and this is what i've come to the fact of matthew this is what i heard the lord say he said michael i like tents <laughs> that's it he said i like tents that's what i've come to learn at all these years the father really yeah. likes tents. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's true. It is true. It's true. We, we, you can't get away from them. I can't get away from them. And uh, so, so we'll see. I wrote, a, I wrote a whole book about a tent, the one that David set up. Excellent so, book, by the way. Thanks, man. Well, you've got some books too. I encourage people to check out Mike's books. Uh, one is called Fire in the Carolinas. I know you've got another one called Igniting Cities. Uh, you don't have another one, do you? I, I got, I, I'm not yet published, but I have, not yet. Okay. I have two that I'm about to finish and publish. Amazing. Mm. Awesome. We'll look forward to those. Well, well, the first two you wrote really are about revival. Mm-hmm. Uh, one is, is more of a history of some things in the Carolinas here. And the other one is more of a guide, um, some, some keys and things on, how to, well, let's see, it says a guide to breaking open the wells of revival in cities, campuses, and regions. So yeah, just share a little bit about why it, revival history matters. Mm-hmm. Maybe this, this idea of wells of revival, share maybe some of your journey, because I know the Lord's had you on a journey of going to places uh, where there's been revivals and, you know, praying and and, and contending to see you know, some of what's happened before happened again, but even on a greater level. So mm. yeah. Why does, why does revival history matter? It matters. It matters a whole bunch because when you begin to understand that God moves in generations and not just what's going on with us, it really mm. opens you up to the fact that, wow, we are involved in a narrative in a storyline that is connected to people who lived before us centuries ago. And we're actually invited to carry in what God started in them and to bring it where we're supposed to bring it in our generation and then hand it off to the next. Um, Mm. It it really, when you begin to see it that way, I think you really begin to understand, wow, 
God really does value um, um, wells of revival, lands, and uh, and the generation storyline. A big thing, Matthew, that really got me into this was actually a powerful insight from John chapter 4. John chapter 4 is the famous story, right, of when Jesus went to the woman at the well. Yeah. And um, a lot of us know this story. And when he goes there, when I first read it, it said he went to the sound of, town of Sychar and sat by Jacob's well. And that always um, really bothered me in a good way. And it led me to investigate. I got to, I got to, what is about this place? And so that led me to understanding something very miraculous. And this is what it was. Joshua 24, John 4 led me back to Joshua 24. And that's when Joshua carried the nation of Israel into uh, the promised land. The final chapter, the whole book of Joshua is about conquest of the land, but the final chapter is different, and it's about settling into the land. In the last part of that mm-hmm. chapter, there's this bizarre passage. It's bizarre. I never knew what to do with it. And it's basically it says that they took Joseph's bones from Egypt and buried him at that spot. And that spot is named Shechem and Joshua 24. Well, when I thought about they buried Joseph's bones in Shechem, I thought, wait a minute, here's, a, here's a something to think about. Joseph's bones, I said, wait a minute, they traveled the desert for 40 years. So that meant they carried a coffin in the desert for 40 years. Wow. And then I did a little math, and I said, well, wait a minute. From the time Moses led out of Egypt into to the desert, from the time Joseph died to Moses, the Bible says that's 400 years. So you mean to tell me mm. that Joseph's bones were 400 years old, even before they set out on the, on the journey. And then the, the, the Hebrews carried a coffin of Joseph's bones that had been around for 400 years into this spot so they could put his bones to rest at the land of Shechem. That blew my wow. mind. Blew my mind. It's crazy. Isn't it crazy? Because it showed me, Matthew, that, wow, holy cow, the, uh, the, the Israeli people, the Hebrew people value the generational storyline. They value the forefather so much they would do that. But here's the other thing, Shechem. I said, what is it about this place, Shechem? So I, I looked it up in Hebrew. I was stunned when I realized the Greek translation for Shechem, Shechem is Sychar. So then I was like, oh, my gosh. So back to John 4, Jacob's well, Joseph's bones, Joseph's son. Uh, Joseph was the son of Jacob. So yeah. now this, this opened me up, Matthew, because this is what really started me biblically on this whole journey of redigging wells and how important it is, is that when Jesus went to the woman at the well, there was a couple dynamics going on. See, there's two wells. There's always the well within us, and there's the well within the land. And those two wells Mm. hold the waters of God. And so when Jesus went to the woman at the well, he was tapping open her well out of your belly, right? Rivers of living water shall flow. But he was also tapping over and open the generational well that was right there. And so if you think about it this way, Jesus has a conversation with a woman, a Samaritan, who was basically a racial barrier. There was cultural barriers. Jesus broke that, right, by talking to her and and essentially showing her love and forgiveness. And it strikes me that as Jesus is talking to her at this well, underneath Jesus' feet and that woman's feet rest the bones of Joseph and acts as even his brothers. So essentially, Jesus is offering forgiveness to the Samaritan woman on the bones of Joseph who offered forgiveness to his brothers when they treated him unjustly. I know that's a lot to unpack, but I that passage alone showed me that there are two wells that the Father desires to break open. There's wells in us, and there's wells mm-hmm. in the land. And somehow, Matthew, I've learned that the two wells are connected together. The man is always tied to the land. So there is what he's doing in us is also connected to what he's doing into the land and the regions he calls us to. Mm. That's so good. How, how are so? How are they connected? Uh, 
That's a, what a great question. So here, here's the deal. So the Samaritan woman, right, at that place. So what Jesus is doing in her, he's freeing her up. He's, he's releasing that forgiveness. Essentially, when she said, listen, I got five married, my five husbands, and this one ain't working, <laughs> right. you know, she's the woman's in sin. I mean, there's just no other way to sugarcoat it. Now, Jesus yeah. doesn't say that. But by him merely conversating, by his presence, his love, his asking questions brings that conviction. And then that redemption, her eyes are open. And here's what's wild, Matthew. That's the connection because at that Shechem place, Joseph forgave his brothers. Jesus is forgiving this woman, essentially. So what's happening within the woman is also what was buried in the land. So there's there's a DNA connection of what the what's forgiveness was laid in the land as a foundation. And it's like Jesus and that Samaritan woman are tapping into that DNA and forgiveness is breaking a racial cultural barrier. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, totally. So forgiveness was in the land, but forgiveness was what was happening in in her heart as well. Absolutely. A thousand percent. That's incredible. Isn't that, yeah, isn't that amazing? So it's amazing. here's one last part of that story that I think a lot of us don't realize or just, just skip over. Isn't it yeah. fascinating that she is the first person? She is the first person where Jesus in the Gospels reveals himself plainly as the Messiah. He hadn't even done that to his 12 yet. But he says to that woman in John 4, I am he who am speaking to you, the Messiah. So you take a step yeah. back and think, wow, not only was she was a woman, which was, again, that was a big cultural thing then, but also a Samaritan. And he, she was privileged with the honor of seeing Jesus plainly as who he was. He, he revealed himself to her. That was the first. And she becomes essentially, you ready? The church's first evangelist. Ah! <laughs> she, she becomes, in essence, the church's first evangelist. And I have to believe that, that there, even though there's something going on deep personally, it's also connected to what Joseph laid the groundwork for years and centuries prior that's in that same region. And so when we talk about redigging wells, when we talk about setting tents up and filling the air with unending worship and prayer because he's worthy, what if we're also tapping into similar things that happened on that same piece of land or region with our ancestors? There's a there's a synergy that happens that that begins to break open. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. <laughs> so good. Yeah. So so that term, just to kind of give some context for people, the, the phrase well of revival, I don't know who exactly came up with it. I know Lou Engle wrote a book some years back using, using that term, but there's this idea of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and Abraham dug a well and then Isaac redug it and then Jacob redug it. And so it's this idea of going back to a place mm. related to your forefathers or the generations before you going back to that place yes. and redigging, opening back up, uh, something that they had labored for something they had worked for in the previous generations. And that, that if we can sort of uncover mm-hmm. uh, what 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 has got, happened in the years before the generations before, that there will be this flow of life uh, and this release of uh, God's purposes again. Yes. And so, anyway, that's where that that idea of wells of revival. That's why we call it wells of revival because there's that biblical mm-hmm. that biblical principle there. So. So Mike, would you encourage people to do some research? I mean, I know you, you do a lot of research. you you study, I mean, you wrote a whole book on revival history. That's really some groundbreaking stuff for the Carolinas, but would you encourage people to do some research and study history? I, oh, a thousand percent. I would, I, I, I wholeheartedly would. I mean, you know, the Hosea said, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And uh, mm. there is a responsibility for us, especially in the generation we live in now, where technology and research uh, 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 tools and devices are at our fingertips more than ever. Yeah. Um, where it's easy, it's more convenient and quicker. Absolutely. I, I think there's no question we should absolutely um, study things out. Now, I also understand that that 
we are made differently. We carry different graces. You know, not everybody's sure. going to have a grace or a stirring to research or dig. That could be the thought of that could be draining or or even it's just <laughs> not in you. That's OK. Find somebody yeah. next to you that does, because there right. there is a real strong value in it. Um, you know, we, we talk here a lot about the power of, let's say, the Logos word, the written word, but also the Rhema word. And uh, what I have learned, you need both. But what I have learned, if, yeah. if I have a stronger foundation with the Logos word, if I have more uh, more of a foundation in me of the written word or, or, or an understanding of those things, then I give a greater opportunity for more Rhema to land on my big landing pad of Logos. So I, I see that mm. the same way. So if I have a really strong knowledge base historically of a region city, then I'm going to give an opportunity to receive more rhema of what the spirit's saying for that region. Right, right. Totally. Well, maybe share a little bit about your journey in some of this. Like if, you know, how this is, how you've well, seen this play out. Um, you know, I mean, I, I think the revelation you just gave is awesome. It's all, it's also pretty, I mean, it's a lot, <laughs> it's a lot, you know, but it's, it's, it's wonderful, but give us some like, practical give us some story like i know mm -hmm. you've been on a journey with the holy spirit in uh in your own life of of trying to to you know follow this principle that you just laid out in the scripture so maybe just yes. give, give people a little bit of context for your own life how what this has looked like that's, that's absolutely i want to i want to take a few minutes and share a personal story of how that revelation worked out practically in my life I was a Bible college student uh, in Dunn, North Carolina, and I was a small, small Pentecostal college. I came out of rehab because before I knew the Lord, I was, I was really messed up in drugs, and I got radically saved. God sent me to a small Bible college in Dunn, North Carolina. Here's what's wild about the backstory of that is my father is from Dunn, and all of my dad's side of the family is from that town. I had never been there in my life until I became a Bible college student. Well, I'm there, and I never forget, I heard our theology professor speak of a revival movement that took place in Dunn, North Carolina in 1906 and in 1907 called the Azusa East Revival. Now, I had heard of Azusa Street in California, but not Azusa East and, and, North, and Dunn in North Carolina, and it just struck me. And he, he mentioned the minister whose name was G.B. Cashwell. And he went from North Carolina to California, got filled with the Holy Spirit, brought the movement back to Dunn, rented a three-story tobacco warehouse, and, and, and all these people from the South came, and the Holy Spirit broke out, and basically the same miracles and the same Holy Spirit movements that were happening in Los Angeles begin to occur in Dunn, North Carolina. I'll use the word phenomenon. It was a, it was a natural, it was a spiritual phenomenon that was happening. And yeah. He's explaining this to me, Matthew, and I'm burning inside. All the other students in the class, they're barely staying awake. You know, it's history. <laughs> but for some reason, I couldn't shake it. And so I, yeah. I, I, I went to him after class and I said, hey, where did this take place? And he goes, well, we don't know. He goes, there's a genualized thought of where this took place, but, but we really don't know the exact location. So I said, well, tell me where, where that is. And so he told me and you know, it's young, I'm, I'm on fire, I'm, and I'm like, I'm going to find out where this was. And so I get in my car, little Ford Escort, hunchback car, and I go and I start driving around this little town done. And all of a sudden I get to a stop sign and I see a vacant lot to the right. And I get out of my car and I walk on that vacant lot. There's a little church, little old, old African-American church right next to it. And I said, Father, could this been of the place? And I remember... The only thing I felt was electricity. That's how I can describe it. I felt like electricity went through my body. I began to cry. I became emotional. And I didn't hear anything from the Lord, but I had that sense and that feeling run through me. And I said, maybe this was it. And, and then that was it. And Matthew, I, I forgot about the whole experience. I ended up graduating. Uh, three years later, I'm in Virginia Beach, uh, a student at Regent University. And I'm sitting home in our, our apartment one day, and I get, a, I get a letter in the mail with a newspaper clipping. And it's a friend of mine from North Carolina, and it says, hey, we think you should go to this and, and check into it. And basically what it was is it was a, it was a ceremony. The, the Several Pentecostal churches in eastern North Carolina got together and dedicated 
the Azusa East Revival site with a big state marker. And I thought, oh my gosh, they found the place. It's, they found it. So the article said basically this research team was hired for 18 months to find out where this Azusa East took place. More, more national attention was coming to it. And so I said, uh -huh. wow. And so it just stuck me. That, that same burning revisited me and I couldn't sit still. Hmm. And I said, Father, what do you want me to do? And he said, go to Dunn. Drove in the car five hours and I met with the researchers in a hot dog stand. And they go, this is unbelievable. They said, do you want us to take you to the site? I said, yep. And Matthew, we went over to the site. And sure enough, it was the same lot where I stepped on to wow. three or four years prior. And that's when I begin to understand there is something deeper. God is calling me to know something more. This isn't just history. This isn't just a good understanding of what happened in this town i feel i'm personally connected to this what whatever god did you know this story and yeah. then and matthew all of a sudden i started digging into this and when i found out blew me away and now listen to this last part of the story so i start researching everything i can about this minister gb cashwell i get so yeah. undone because of through him, he basically brought the whole Pentecostal movement to the South. Twelve Pentecostal yeah. denominations were born. I mean, it was huge. But what struck me the most is he was only in the movement for three years. And then he disappeared. No one knew what happened to him. And I'm like, I have to find out what happened to this man. And so yeah. one day I visited the Dunn Cemetery where he was buried, went to the graveyard, stood on his bones. Can't get away from it. It's a John 4 <laughs> moment. It's a Jesus at the woman at the well. It's Joshua putting the bones of Joseph at Shechem. And I stood on his grave, and I, this is my prayer to God. I said, Father, I don't understand what's going on in me and what you're doing. All I know is somehow my life is connected with this man's life who lived 100 years ago. And if you're calling me to finish what he started, my answer is yes. I have no idea what it means, but my answer is yes. Two, Matthew, two weeks later, two, three weeks later, my aunt, who's not even saved, doesn't even know the Lord, has nothing to do with any of this, calls my father and says, hey, I've been doing our family genealogy, hired a genealogist, spent $5,000 before Ancestry.com hmm. came out. And she said, yeah. I've compiled a book of our family records and I'd like to give them to you. So we meet my aunt. We go. And all of a sudden I start looking through the book and I drop it. My mouth drops because I look and I find out that Cashwell is one of my dag on descendants. I've actually <laughs> descended from this man because he was from Dunn, as was my family. And I felt like the Lord was saying, this is my answer to your prayer. This is mm. this isn't just a flash in the pan. Your entire life missionally is connected to what this man did 100 and something years ago. And that's when I knew, okay, the redigging of the wells is a very real concept. Last, last part of this, and Matthew, this is where you come in. You remember this. In this same little town, Dunn, North Carolina, I, that, that story is what led me to write Fire in the Carolinas, the book on Cashwell's life. So through that process, word got out, and a teacher in the Dunn High School came to me and basically said, would you come share your testimony at the public high school in Dunn, North Carolina? I said, absolutely, I will. And it yeah. was like 70 choir workers, the kids, the high school students, all their families, like a thousand people in the auditorium. And Matthew, that night, the spirit of God broke out and 50 kids rushed the altar in a public high school, got saved. Come on. A Holy Spirit movement broke out in the high school. And that's what started the tent, the Jesus tent. But that's not the point I want to make. The point I want to make is this. It just blows my mind that prayers in done, that saying yes to God in done from what God did 100 years ago seemed to open a door in my present that looked like a whole high school getting impacted. You can't wow. make that stuff up, man. <laughs> that's incredible. Amazing. I love the story uh, that the Lord's writing in your life. Um, and 
the principles, the lessons we can learn from it. So, I mean, not everybody's going to have quite a, a dramatic story as you've had <laughs> with some of this stuff. Um, but I think anybody can begin to begin to understand their place in the story that God's mm. writing and begin to tap into um, his purposes for their lives and for their, their city, the region they find themselves in. Mm. What, um, what have you seen in terms of like, how, how do you begin to redig? I mean, we kind of use that phrase, but what does that actually mean? How do you begin to redig the wells of revival? You go, Oh man, my great grandfather, he, he was a missionary and I found this out or in my city, the circuit riders came through and there was a revival or something in the past. You know, if, if you begin to discover these wells, how do we begin to uh, redig them? Does that make sense? Perfect sense. First practical step is the best one, and that's obviously pray and ask the Holy yeah. Spirit specifically, though, for direction um, on on what you're sensing, what you're feeling, what you feel like he's leading you to. Second step is, to me, digging the well is the research process. So if we look mm. at Isaac, who said he redug his father's wells, Abraham's, you know, that was not easy work. You know, back in Bible days, they filled it with earth. You know, they stuffed the well. So you had to get your hands dirty to redig a well. You had to get down in the trenches. You had to scoop out mud. You had to scoop out a bunch of stuff to get to that pure water, that artesian well. So redigging the wells does look like a lot of non, uh, non, or how should I say, it? not flamboyant, flashy ministry powerful spotlight it looks like a lot of behind the scenes researching digging reading studying asking questions um and going deep in that way uh and that's i think that kind of separates it from a lot of other things there's a there's a level of humility that it requires to redig out wow, wells yes. because you're not doing it for recognition or to feed some level of approval even in yourself you're really doing it because it's his dream and it's what he desires. And that, that becomes the motivator. Uh, so, so that research process, now that can look many ways. Like remember I was saying there's always two wells. There's the wells in us and the wells in the land. So to yeah. redig the well within us obviously could look like some family genealogy. And, and again, I know that could even seem overwhelming to people, but not really because the technology we have at our fingertips makes it so easy today. And there are yeah. a few a few free uh, sites that you could use beside Ancestry. So here's some practical ones that I've used. Obviously, you could use Ancestry.com if you want to dig some wells out of your own family line. Great. So it's a subscription, but they got great records. A free source is FamilySearch.org. FamilySearch.org has an incredible database of genealogical records um, that are free. You just have to create a, a simple account that you have access to. I know this sounds a little weird, but it's really awesome. It's called findagrave.com. Findagrave.com, <laughs> great site, free. And they have over 2.9 million cemetery records in, in uh, America and in, in the nations. And basically, if you have a relative and you're trying to figure out where they were buried maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, a lot of times if they're there, they'll have pictures of the cemetery where they are and even some biography information that will give you more understanding about about your family. So so that's what it looks yeah. like for, for me, digging wells out of my family, digging wells out of the land could obviously researching that out. Um, it could look like what you were mentioning, Matthew. Was there any revival movement that happened here in the past? Um, was there was there anything that God did in the past? For instance, Azusa Street Revival. Okay, that's Los Angeles, California. Well, let me do a Google search on the history of God's moving in Los Angeles, California. Uh, let me do a, a search on what what churches have birthed out of Los Angeles, California over the years. And like with so many things, if you can begin, this is the third step, if you can begin to identify themes and patterns out of your research mm. or what you discover, then you can begin to discern this is where grace is on. This is the, the right. grace is on this in this land because now there's been a historical pattern repeating itself of what God's did in this city or this region over an extended period of time. So if we took Shechem, for example, 
Joshua 24 is not the first time. It's actually Genesis 12. Genesis 12, 1, Abraham builds the first altar at Shechem. Then you see Joshua 24, jo- uh, Joshua puts Joseph's bones at Shechem. And then you see John 4, Jesus revisits the woman at Shechem. And then you go into Acts uh, 5, 6, and 7. And when uh, uh, Philip is sent to Samaria, he's actually sent to Shechem, Sychar, where the Holy Spirit breaks out and the apostles anoint them when the Holy Spirit gives. So you look at the progression. God loves to revisit the same place over and over. And But what, mm-hmm. what when you look at a higher view, you could see the theme and the repetitive patterns in those passages of what God's doing. You could see a, a theme that helps you tap into the storyline over the actual region. Does that make sense? Totally. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I believe that God has unique purposes, unique destiny for cities, mm. for churches, for regions, for nations, people groups. And yeah, what you're talking about is, is beginning to get insight into God's prophetic purposes, his, his destiny, his desire uh, for those peoples, for those places and we can see uh, through history the way those have begun to manifest at times. And I think even sometimes, even some of the negative things that you discover in histories of land give us insight because a lot of times the enemy will war against God's purposes. And then you can realize, oh, okay, there's has been a place of di- division and that kind of thing. Maybe God's, God's purposes for our city is actually that it would be a place of unity, and reconciliation things like that. And so, uh, yeah, totally agree. There's God has a purpose. God has a uh, destiny um, for, I believe, individual congregations, individual mm-hmm. cities, nations, people groups. And, uh, and and part of what we're talking about is, is lining ourselves up with that, becoming aware of that. Mm-hmm. And then we can begin to line our lives up and our prayers. We can be in a, to line up our intercession in, in alignment with God's purposes, His desire, like you said, not only in the written word, the logos, but also in in uh, the rhema word, the the specific things that he has um, for the places, the land that we find ourselves yes. in. And then when we begin to line ourselves up, man, that's when things start breaking open, don't they? When we yes. begin to pray prayers in alignment with his word, and we begin to to begin to live and act in a way that's in agreement with with those purposes, we really begin to see his power released. Well, and here's another way to look at what you just said, Matthew, which is exciting, is that there are two concepts also here. There's the power of the opened well and the power of the open heaven. And so mm. when the when the well and the earth and the land is open, there is a connection that opens up a well in the sky. I mean, right? Jacob's ladder. There are angels mm. ascending and descending in that ladder, right? So there are pockets and places, I believe, in the earth that have those things. And I've also seen in Scripture where there is a, such a connection point of as the well opens up, it triggers the air to open up. It triggers the, the open heaven. And what I mean by open heaven, I'm talking about the spiritual atmosphere. I'm talking about the spiritual atmosphere of a city and region. I mean, you can go through some cities right now in America. You walk in them and you feel it feels dark. I'm not going to name any right now, but I'm just saying it feels right. dark. It feels it's slimy. True. It's like, whoa, oppressive. But yet I can walk into another city and it doesn't feel that way. It feels light. Yeah. It feels clear. It feels that we could use the term, right, that the air is thin. And I believe that that has a lot to do with the spiritual atmosphere uh, over that place. And so the more I believe that as we follow him and we're actually able to see wells open up and redig them, what we're doing is we're realigning, I like that word, we're realigning, we're realigning our cities to the original purpose that God had for them. Yeah. Yeah. So good. I love it. Yeah, I mean, just quick example. I mean, we're here in Greenville, North Carolina. We have the largest medical facility, mm. you know, east east of Raleigh. I believe, you know, part of part of God's even on the little city symbol for our city. There's like a leaf on it, you know. And I'm 
the, the Bible says, le- you know, there's leaves for the healing of the nations, you know? So I believe healing is one of the destinies of, wow. of our city. You know what I mean? That's awesome. So like, and there's, there's others, you know, but I think you can begin to, to, to see God's purposes as you begin to study and pray and see what God's doing. Um, yeah, but I love that with Jacob, that, that Jacob had a well, but he also had a ladder. That's good. <laughs> That's right. I like that. That's awesome. I love that. Powerful. Man, so good. Yeah. Well, man, um, give, give us a sense of, of, of how this is kind of playing out uh, with you nowadays. I mean, I know you're, you're there in Greenville. I mean, I, I know there's even some storyline related to, to <laughs> how you got there and, and, and what's stirring there. But as we, as we kind of get closer to the end of the podcast here, give us a sense of like what's, what's stirring there in Greenville, South Carolina, kind of what's the latest in your journey? Absolutely. Well, my journey from uh, North Carolina to South Carolina has been has has been really one of maturity. I guess I could put that on there. And the best way I can do it personally is when when we were together, when we were uh, had the Jesus tent, we were moving around in that season. I think there was a really strong call on my wife and I to be revivalists, to be igniters, uh, to to help start fires to help clear the spiritual environments and atmospheres out of cities and regions so that the gospel could go forth strong. So dreams could flow and touch uh, people. And and, and so that, you know, those things could happen. As I transition to Greenville, I feel like the Lord has moved me more into a fatherly role. Um, It's Mm. not that, you you know, being part of a revivalist igniting fires ever leaves. It's, but we mature, we, we grow as we follow him, as we deepen him, we grow in different places. And so I feel that personally we've moved into more of a father and mothering role versus us taking the tent out and being um, troops, troops on the ground as we were before. And so now we have more of a responsibility to raise up the next generation, to pass the stories along, to equip them uh, with the, the, just the fire that it does take to do something like that. And so for me, it has definitely been more of a shift into fathering and mothering. Um, and that's, that's mainly our role over the, over the college is to be a father yeah. uh, over, over the students. And I'm, I'm learning in my own process and journey, Matthew, that it really is the highest call. I think some, mm-hmm. sometimes we get this confused, especially in our spirit, spirit field, charismatic circles that I mean, I've been a part of for so many years, is that I used to ask the God this question. Is it apostle and prophet or is it fathers and sons? Hmm. Good question. Because I, I, I hear both yeah. and I know both have such a strong, you know, in, on one hand, you know, you have Ephesians 4, right? The, the grace for the apostolic, the prophetic to build, equip the saints in the church. But then also we have Paul in Corinthians saying, you have 10,000 teachers, but the, 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 the condition that the church is in is not because you don't have uh, less apostolic and prophetic things going on. It's because you don't have any fathers stepping up. Yeah. And I, I feel like we're in a season right now where God has reconciled that in my own life. And so what that looks like for me is having the lens of there's a missional side and then there's a relational side. And I, I believe that a lot of us sometimes we can we could move as prophets and evangelists and, and teachers and somehow forget that we're fathers first. So it's not that, you know, that it's wrong, but it's the order of things. Mary and Martha both bring things to the table, but Jesus said it's better if it's Martha first and then Martha out of that place. I believe that God is calling the global church into a higher role of fathering and mothering, not so much being apostolic and prophetic, although it's very important, but it's the order of it. It's, it's fathering and mothering and letting our missional apostolic and prophetic flow out of that place. Um, I feel personally, that's where I'm at. Um, and that's what God's been doing with Amber and I. And so, yeah, it's been really, yeah. it's been quite a journey, but again, I, I, this is what I overall feel for the, the church is I feel from the father. He really wants to mature the bride. I mean, where this thing is going, yeah. right? We're the bride of Christ, the Shulamite bridal identity. Um, and he really wants a mature bride for his son. And I believe that's why there's such a call of raising up fathers and mothers in this hour. Yes. Come on. 
So good. I love it, man. Well, Mike, thank you for, for being on the podcast today. And uh, I think people are really going to be encouraged by all of this. Hey, if, if people want to connect with you or with uh, Garden College there in South Carolina, yes. what's, what's the best way they can do that? Oh, man, absolutely. Guys, you can check our website. It's gardencollege.com. Um, also, we're on social media as Garden College, you know, uh, Instagram, especially, and, and uh, those social media platforms. And our church is called the Garden Greenville. And uh, our school runs out of the church. So we're all together. We're all one. So, but yeah, love, love for you to check it out. Yeah. Hey, Mike, would you mind uh, closing us out in prayer and just praying for people that are tuning in? Absolutely. Father, I just thank you right now just for you and who you are. And I thank you so much uh, how you lead us. You know, your leadership is without flaws. It is perfect. And you lead us uh, to, to see things break open in cities and regions. And my prayer right now is whoever's listening, your leadership would overtake their life right now. And that you would begin to speak to them. That you would begin to uncap wells within them that have been locked and stuff for way too long. Just as you broke open the well of love in the Samaritan woman's heart, Father, I pray that you would break open the well of your presence, of your joy in anyone listening. Yes. And I pray, mm -hmm. Father, that you would equip them, equip them with joy, equip them with mercy, equip them with grace and strength in the days ahead. And I pray, Father, that uh, the, the missional assignments on their life will become more clear as they continually abide and connect with you, Father. And so, Lord, give us that generation. I'm, I'm praying, Father, give us that mature generation. Give us that mature bride that you're longing for, that you're aching for, uh, that won't be easily offended. But, Father, that we'll have the ability of long-suffering, that we'll have the ability to get our hands dirty, that we'll have the ability to dig things out of our culture and to dig things out of this generation that may be get messy or that may be get hurtful, but that will stick to it. God, give us that generation of mothers and fathers who will continually yes. dig out the truths and the treasures, but then also all the hurts and pains that this generation carries, Father, so that we could be a mature bride, that we could be a mature Shulamite bride ready to receive your son. So we love you, mm -hmm. Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.